I think that using the rationalization and excuse that security is complex um, is, is a broken argument. And the reason is, is that everything in life is complex. And this is the first time you and I are talking, so I would love to know a bit about Traceable. Talk a bit about what is company all about. What do you folks do, especially when we look at the whole security or AI space? Well, Traceable AI is an API security platform company. And we can't really talk about Traceable without talking about our roots, uh, which includes our founder, Jyoti Bansal uh, and Sanjay Nagaraj. Uh, and Jyoti had success with App Dynamics, an application performance metrics platform, um, where the the founders learned how to operate at massive enterprise scale, which is incredibly important in the API security space. There's a lot of APIs and they're being used all the time. Um, and our customers are transacting in the hundreds of billions of API calls per month. And what we do is not just catalog discovery and visibility of APIs, uh, but we're able to do normative baseline analytics against the risk and threat of APIs. And we are able to do it at massive scale. So. We can catch things that are uh, being abused by the bad guys before uh, companies ever get notices about them from a vulnerability or a published um, threat standpoint. Uh, we're able to discover those unknown, unknown threats within their environments uh, because of the way that we've built our platform, you know, different at the architectural core. Uh, so we've been in uh, a business now coming out of stealth about two years ago, um, and the company has uh, had explosive growth. And uh, and it's fun to be a part of another one of Jyoti Bansal's enterprises. When we look at the whole evolution of security landscape, especially with the emergence of cloud, cloud native, how different is API security from traditional security? In my case, I have an unfair advantage in, in this particular question because I don't come from the solution side historically. Uh, personally, I've been in solutions for about five years, but before that, I was 20 plus years in the corporate world. And I was in enterprise uh, roles, including CIO and Chief Information Security Officer. Uh, worked in banking for about 17 of those years. So I've been able to see the evolutions of the security and technology stacks uh, over the last almost 35 years. And as we've gone from uh, you know mainframe isolated systems to client server to data centers and now to cloud, uh, what we see is, is that there is a virtualization that's been happening where we continuously virtualize upward. Um, you know, first we virtualized compute and processing and storage, and now we're virtualizing everything in layer seven. So all of the ways that applications interact with each other is now using APIs. Uh, you don't have to do point-to-point -point integrations. You don't have to do point-to-point uh, -point data uh, connectors. And today, all of this cool stuff and massive business value is being delivered with APIs, except um, there's been very little in the way of security over the last decade in the API space. So developers have been developing, cool things have been happening, but now uh, bad things are, are really beginning to rack up in the API space because uh, bad actors are realizing that they could just attack those APIs and get the same outcomes that they used to have uh, when they had to learn all of the uh, other layers of technology and other layers of security now they can just do those with APIs and bot armies and a number of other techniques that are um, easier in, in order for them to exploit your systems. And, you know, we kind of live in an API-centric or API-driven world, uh, as you just pointed out to it. Uh, so let's also talk about uh, the kind of uh, how serious or how severe, you know, it when it comes to API security is because when we look at API, it's not just, you can talk about zombie APIs. There, there's, it's, it's, it's a very big, very complicated space. So, so now let's look at uh, this report that you folks did. First of all, let's talk about what was the goal of, uh, you know, this state of API security report. And then we'll talk about what are some of the key findings that gives us a very good visibility into the state of API security. When we looked at the landscape of analyses and studies that had been done previously about API security, we saw a gap that we addressed with our approach to the, the issue. We coordinated with Larry Ponemon and Sue Ponemon, which is a great experience. Uh, you're dealing with one of the most uh, well-known people in security studies um, on the planet. And as we approached Larry for a discussion about this, we said, look, what we don't want to do is what we've seen in the past, which is API security studies 
that focus on prior breaches or exploits. Um, there's only so much that we can learn from history. What we really need to understand is what are the reasons and the mechanisms that are causing people not to make a decision to secure their API plane today? Why aren't people moving quickly? And when we look at the results and the findings that came out of this study, um, there are very few things that shock me anymore in technology after three decades of being in it, but I was completely shocked uh, to see what was mathematically a representation of the cognitive dissonance, this huge gap between people universally stating API security is an issue, a problem, a concern, a threat. It's a growing threat. Um, and even more importantly, 74% of the uh, companies that responded, more than 1,700 companies, 77% um, uh, of them stated that they've experienced more than three API-related exploits or breaches in the last 24 months. And yet when we look at the study itself as it relates to, and what are you doing about it? Um, the answer is 50, 60, 70% of companies are doing nothing. And I, I don't know that there's much of a, a, you know, an example in technology history that we can look at that, that, that there's ever been a time in this history that we see everybody universally agreeing that API, uh, APIs are a risk and a threat and that almost everybody is also saying, I'm not doing anything about it. This gap um, really, really represents uh, the most important findings out of this study, uh, that we're, we're seeing people sitting and admiring the problem of API security while not necessarily changing their architectural focus, their budgetary focus, their resource focus on addressing the, the risks and threats that APIs represent today. What is the reason for this gap? Is it, I mean, the tools are there, completely traceable, you folks are there. Is it, once again, as you're saying, you know, initially we started talking about the whole shift left movement and everything else, but that sounds more like on paper, but those things are not uh, taking place in real life and practice. So is it cultural uh, which is needed or it's like, once again, CISOs, budgetary? Did you also try to find, you know, what is the cause of this gap? Well, I think there's a, a couple of causes that are really um, well articulated in the report findings. Um, or they're imp implied and inferred. So a great example of one that's implied and inferred is, is it is very difficult for companies on a percentage basis in response to this study to find resources and money to address this problem, which suggests that, that we've spent 20 or 30 years building our current state um, security stack, and it's extremely difficult for us to change course. And why this is a problem is because for the bad actors, they are not burdened with those problems, right? They're not burdened with things that slow them down, organizational structures, budgetary decisions. Um, they're opportunistic. And our security organizations today are not agile in the face of that opportunistic behavior on, the on behalf of the bad guys. So that's problem number one that clearly is, is shown in the results that we see. The other is, is that... Um, it requires us to rethink how technology is actually working today. When we think about virtualization and we think about APIs being the neural network that connects all of this um, data and all of these applications today, that's completely different than what monolithic applications look like. It's completely different than what landed data centers look like. And, um, and we're not really addressing that change. And you mentioned shift left, and I think this is really interesting. Um, an example of, of why people are not registering the need of, uh, you know, Im implementing API security within their organizations comes with the very simple test that I frequently ask CISOs, which is if API security is supposed to be specific to AppSec and you are attacked by a bad actor who uses APIs and a bot army to attack your application front end and shut down your digital channels, what vulnerability is that? And there's usually a pause and people go, well, that's not really an application vulnerability. And then my response is, then why are you putting all of your attention for API security in AppSec exclusively? Because APIs now represent a universal attack layer. I can use them to DOS your applications. I can use them to exfiltrate data. I can use them to create fraudulent accounts as well as take over existing accounts. And I can use them like network type packets 
to do dot or to do um, you know attacks against your uh, applications as well as all of your landed digital assets. And so I think that there's a lack of understanding in the marketplace of the diversity of ways that APIs can be used to ac- attack and exploit. And I think that's really where the gap is today. People really don't understand how this universal attack layer uh, of APIs works. Um, and and it makes it difficult for them to make, make the next step to think about it architecturally and from a security standpoint. What kind of changes you think organizations need uh, uh, to have so that, once again, going back to the problem that you're talking about, so they're not looking at the wrong things. They are looking, when they look at the security, they should look at the, uh, they should have a holistic approach towards security. Yeah, you know, look, there's patterns that repeat themselves. And and I think this gets lost in many of our technology conversations today. There was a time when you could walk into a data center and say, how many firewall rules do I have? And your security analyst would look at you and go, I don't know, right? Um, you know, that's an unacceptable answer today. There's times when you could say, how many virtual machines do I have? And your your engineers would look at you and say, I don't know how many virtual machines we have. You know, they're kind of like popcorn. I can make as many as I want, right? Um, and yet today there's no no a place for a conversation to start with. I don't know how many virtual machines I have or how many web applications my employees are using. Or we see these patterns historically where developers are typically five to eight years ahead of security. That's an understandable you know, pattern because developers' jobs are to deliver business value using technology. Security always follows behind because we don't really understand the dimensions of the risk and threat until things get into production. So I think that when we look at you know this uh, you know this need for change, we need to be respectful of history and go, how did we solve these problems previously? A solution is a part of that, but one of the things that really is clear is there is no governance. There is no policy framework. There are no security guidelines um, writ large that are being applied to the API space. And so we're all collectively learning on the job, not just you know the solution providers like Traceable, but the bad actors are learning on the job and uh, our, our enterprise organizations and government agencies are learning on the job. It's clear that solution providers and bad actors are learning faster than the enterprise space is. And that's where we need to see those gear shifts change. We need to see intellectual curiosity within enterprises to say, how are all the different ways that I can be exploited, breached, or attacked? And am I reducing or expanding my threat and and risk surface or attack surface every day? And if I'm not reducing it, what do I need to do to change that? And I think that there's just a lot of questions that are coming to the fore, but you know, back to your, you know, the most important point that you made, Swap. Now, the rea- reality is, is that it is gaining attention today because more and more bad things are happening in the API space. And the breaches that are happening in the API space are extremely troubling because it's not just, you know, in the case of a major uh, mobile carrier, they didn't just lose your personal data again, which is a very common outcome of most breaches and exploits. They lost your entire uh, bill payment history. Uh, They lost what plan you were subscribing to. They lost a tremendous amount of contextual information that is extremely important to the bad actors when they engage in social engineering and other types of hacks and breaches. And this is the kind of data that's being exposed in these API hacks. And I think that, sadly, there's a certain cynical part of me as a former CISO that says, all we need is another news story and people will get much more motivated about API security. But frankly, after 30 or 40 years of security, we should be well beyond needing bad news driving business decisions. We should be making decisions based upon what's important for the reduction of risk and threat within our environments. Very well said. And also when you're talking about that organizations need to be more uh, kind of creative or, you know, curious about it. But whose responsibility is it? Who owns API security? Because when it becomes everybody's problem, actually, it is nobody's problem. That is very, very true. And um, I'm going to point to the study uh, results on on this particular question, because I think it's really telling about how fragmented the decision making and the responsibility assignment is right now in the enterprise. Um, We see, obviously, a large percent of respondents, almost 20 percent that say it. It's the CISO's remit, right? 
But then we see an almost equal number, 17% or so, saying it belongs to CIOs and CTOs. And I think that's really interesting because um, we have a very specific security problem here, very specific risk and threat problem here. And yet there's one out of five respondents that are saying this is actually a technology problem bigger than just the CISO. Um, we're also seeing assignment, it should belong to the line of business, which is also an interesting um, development because it's suggesting that developers that are associated with those particular business units should have the obligation for API security. So I think that this, um, this kind of fragmentation today of who should be assigned the responsibility for API security is also a representation of what problems that we have. Because we're still arguing who should be owning API security, and the bad actors, once again, are not burdened with that problem. Um, in fact, they like the idea that nobody knows who API security should be assigned to. Um, because if there's one thing that bad actors love is they love gaps and, and blind spots and processes and organizations and in structures and in frameworks. So I think current state today suggests nobody's sure. I will say definitively, and this is Richard's observation and opinion, I will say definitively that I believe that, that API security squarely belongs in the chief information security officer's remit, but that does mean we need to change a lot of current state structures around application development and design, security architectures, frameworks, and all of those types of other components of uh, securing our enterprises. Ironic in a way that when we do see all those, you know, news story related to security, mostly we hear about big companies also because they also generate a lot of page views. You know, nobody cares about a tiny company got compromised. Uh, the irony is that, you know, we might assume that, you know, the larger organization you are, uh, the security discussions move to the board rooms, you know, at that level, board level. Uh, do you also see, based on this report, that uh, it also depends on the size and nature of organizations, how they deal with security? Because as I said, most of the time when we look at these breaches, they are compromising some very, very critical uh, information, and there are some very, very large organizations there. You know, certainly the, the headline breaches with tens of millions of accounts or tens of millions of um, users or fraudulent account creation, those grab all of the headlines. There's, a, there's an interesting... Uh, component to this study as well that is showing that when we get into you know small and medium-sized enterprises there's there's a repeat of the same argument that we've heard forever which is well you know i'm a medium-sized enterprise and i don't have a large security organization and i don't have the same kind of money as the big guys to spend and the reason why this is a flawed argument is um, those same companies never have the same uh, defense when it comes to app dev you know, it's funny that you're not, you, you know, it's funny that you're not poor enough to be you know, stopping any API development. Um, and you want the benefits that you get from API development, but you don't want the realities of the economic investments necessary to secure that plane, which is what I think, you know, nets to a flawed argument all the way around, right? You know, you don't get to say, you know, look, I want to go out and buy a Ferrari and be a race car driver and then not to suffer the consequences of having a cool car that goes really, really fast, but you don't know how to drive it. And, and that's what we're kind of seeing in the API space. Oh, look, this is very easy to create an API call. And, and really, when we look in the small and medium-sized enterprise space, the security consequences are actually accruing to the larger enterprises. So APIs today are the primary pathway for third-party access um, for any number of organizations. So now you start to see the API threat and risk of a small company that is in the supply chain of a larger company now creating significant problems for that larger company. So like I said, these are patterns that we've seen before. We've seen part, third party risk issues, you know, manifest in, in monolithic applications and data centers, but it seems like we're also not, you know, applying our learned lessons from those times in these cases. So a lot of young and, and smaller companies using APIs as their primary method for integration or providing services commercialization to large enterprises. And now we have an even further expanded attack surface uh, because these small companies say, I don't have the resources to be able to do security against these APIs. So again, tons of conflicts. Look, I think 
it's not an all bad news conversation. We're obviously seeing, um, you know, decisions and strategy and conceptualization going in the correct direction. Um, the reality is in the API space, whether you're a large company or medium sized company, you need to be moving faster because the bad guys are moving at light speed. And if we're sitting around continuing to admire the problem, trying to figure out what strategies we're going to adopt to fix it, that's just more time that the bad guys have to do bad things. The worst thing with the bad guys versus good guys is that as a good guy, you have to be right 101% time. Bad guys have to be right only once. And that's what the big difference is. Um, can you tell me that, you know, when we look at the the whole, you know, API security, it is complicated depending on the perspective that you look at as you gave the analogy of Ferrari. I'm into sim racing, so I do know what you mean. You know, you cannot just get into Ferrari and put a, uh, or any other sports car and put your, you know, uh, foot on the gas. Uh, it will be out of control. But most people don't even know that and they think that's how it works, uh, which is that the yes, security is complicated depending on how you look at it. It is overwhelming. Also, you know, your teams are already doing so many things. A lot of things are moving into developers pipeline thanks to the shift left movement. Uh, talk a bit about how it's traceable, making it easier for these organizations so that uh, irrespective of, you know, how, you know, they have CISOs, not what a strategy they have, at least some of the critical workloads are uh, kind of safe so that they can, their developer teams continue to focus on adding business value without getting overwhelmed or scared because security sometimes slow you down, it can stop you as well. So, so talk about the role you folks play in helping these organizations that you surveyed? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start my response with something that I think, um, you know, it might be a contentious statement, but I'm known for that in the industry. So I'll just say it. Um, I think that using the rationalization and excuse that security is complex um, is, is a broken argument. And the reason is, is that everything in life is complex. Things in the analog are complex. Um, if you don't believe so, take apart a Swiss watch, uh, you know, that winds and try and put it back together again, right? Uh, you know, our relationships in our family are complicated. You know, we, being, you know, having a family member in, you know, in the hospital, there's complications. We can't use complicated as an excuse anymore. However, when we look at the solution side and to your point about what Traceable is doing about that, um, the, the truth is, is that we, we in the solutions industry for security have spent too much time building solutions that require expertise on the part of the security staff and professionals that are operating it. And, and what this causes is fatigue, right? So I produce tons of information and now you've got to sort through it as a security analyst to try and find, you know, the single risk that is a needle within a needle within the needle of an eye of a needle in a haystack. And, and it becomes very, very difficult. So Traceable is leveraging things like AI, which have been around for years. I don't like to talk about AI nowadays because it seems like it's a new thing, and it's not. Uh, but we use AI to, to grind e enormous amounts of data uh, about these APIs and try and pinpoint the actual moment of threat or exploit or risk in a way that we can manifest it in with context to the security analysts so they go i know exactly what to do now i've got i've got the warning i've got the alert and i know what action i need to take and the next step from that which we also do at traceable is to automate that right now automation has been an interesting challenge because a lot of people say i want something like runtime protect but their internal processes are not yet to a point to be able to ingest uh, an order or a command that says uh, this this application is being attacked, it, shut it down right now. <laughs> um, you know, people are extremely worried in the business side of production impacts and customer impacts. And we haven't conditioned our systems to actually be able to capitalize on these automated capabilities. But we can see a world, and you probably are having tons of conversations swapping with other security providers, where we can see a world where automation orchestration and the the actions taken based upon the decisions generated um, from these new new generation security solutions are going to be able to operate at the speed of the bad actors, which is our biggest um, issue today. And the bad actors are faster, um, but but being able to leverage technologies like AI and threat analytics and normative baseline analytics and runtime protect, you know, all within the traceable suite 
are going to be the way to be able to get ahead of the bad actors um, with every single discovery of, of a potential exploit that we make in your environment. I want to talk about AI. Now, let's look at AI from two different perspectives. I've been asking this question to all the security folks also. That One is uh, AI for security, and second is security for AI. A lot of companies which are running all these AI workloads, what does you know API security mean for them? At the same time, what does you know these new generative AI technologies mean for API security? Let me start with you know AI protection first, because it's actually a very common use case that we're asked about at Traceable. And it, when we talk to large enterprise companies, the very first request that they're making of us is, is can you buy me enough time for, for me as an enterprise organization to figure out how I want to operationalize AI in my organization? And, and really what they're saying is, is help protect my corporate data from being exposed to public or open AI engines, because there is no delete my data button. There is no regulation. There are no um, you know, protections once your corporate data is exposed. And we saw this specifically in the Samsung hack uh, that has drawn so much attention, which is you know, a analyst decided that they wanted to you know, grind a faster spreadsheet and they exposed something like 5% of Samsung's corporate financial data uh, to AI engines. So, you know, it, it, the great thing for us is all prompts, ingestion, outcomes, outputs in the AI space all ride on APIs. And, and because of that reality, we have an unfair advantage in being able to help companies protect their data from being exposed exter externally. So that's job number one for us in the AI space. Now, when we look at it from a product standpoint, um, you know, again, you know, the 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 froth and the excitement about AI has been heavily oriented towards large language models in the media of the last six you know, to nine months. Um, I, again, contentious statement, large language models are actually the least interesting uh, component of the AI space. You know, computational AI and, you know, things that are really advanced like planar geometry and you know, all the different things that take a tremendous amount of work and effort for human beings to calculate um, are, are where AI is getting super interesting. And LLM, LLM AI is interesting, but only for specific use cases. So I would say that, you know, for the solution space, um, our orientation towards computational AI and how we leverage AI to continuously narrow the window of of you know, variables and information associated with one specific threat and now take that one specific threat and multiply it across billions and billions of calls, being able to have that type of laser point accuracy um, is only able to be achieved using AI. And, and that's what we're continuously building and expanding within our security solution, uh, you know, and the traceable platform. And it, it look, and we're not unique in that. Um, I think that if, if companies are not aggressively um, figuring out how to leverage AI to improve analytic results, risk reduction, and automation, um, they're, they're going to be left behind in the, in the overall scheme of things. Um, and, you know, our commitment to AI includes bringing, you know, folks like, you know, the, you know, the founder of AI for UABA, uh, Jisheng Wang, uh, you know, having Dr. Wang on staff is is just another part of our commitment because we've seen the benefits that AI can yield and we've seen it over the course of years, not over the course of the last nine months. Richard, thank you so much for taking time out today and walk us through uh, this, you know, whole report. And also, I mean, there are a lot of worrying some trend, but you also said, you know, that a lot of positive things are also happening. So we hope that, you know, security and, and you're right about that. It is everything in life is complicated. And that's what I said, depending on who you talk to, for a lot of folks, uh, driving a Ferrari and Lamborghini or Bugatti is as easy as driving your, your Kia. But, you know, that's, you know, <laughs> for you, it's easy because you used to be a CISO as well. But, uh, you know, it's good to see companies that are traceable actually helping organizations in securing uh, their workloads, their applications. And I would love to chat with you again, not only whenever you come up with new reports, but also uh, just to keep helping folks in securing their workloads. I, I really appreciate your time today, and I would love to uh, talk to you again soon. Thank you. I, I thoroughly enjoyed myself, and thank you so much, Wapnola. Anytime.
you know, my job is, you know, not just traceable, but to be a resource when it comes to security in the marketplace. And I'm happy to have any conversations you'd like to have in the future.